So let's go live. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this latest uh, EPRS Policy Roundtable. And we're maintaining a tradition uh, which we've developed over the years of presenting some of the most recent findings of the Eurobarometer process by which European public opinion in all the member states on really quite a substantial scale are polled regularly to see their thinking on current issues and on the evolution of the European Union. I'm Anthony Teasdall from the EPRS and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome a panel of experts who are really going to reflect upon the state of European public opinion in the context both of the coronavirus crisis and the changing European Union. We'll be uh, talking together for about uh, 90 minutes and it's a great pleasure in particular to welcome uh, as the kickoff part of this process, Vice President Katrina Barley, who um, has been Vice President of the European Parliament uh, from the beginning of this parliamentary term and is responsible for communications and transparency. She's also a member of the Civil Liberties Committee in the European Parliament, a substitute member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and for much of the decade before joining the European Parliament was a member of the German Bundestag, uh, serving as Secretary General of the German SPD party and as Federal Minister for Family Affairs, uh, for uh, Labour and for Justice, and therefore has a, a wonderful combination of both national and European perspectives uh, on the current state of European opinion. Uh, after Vice President Bali uh, sets the scene, we will pass over to uh, Philip Schulmeister, who's head of the Public Opinion Monitoring Unit, Unit in DG Communication in the Parliament's administration, and has the responsibility for commissioning from Eurobarometer the EP component of the, European, of the Eurobarometer process. There are two parts of this. One is a European Commission set of surveys, and one is European Parliament surveys, and of course they are coordinated and dovetail. But we always get a very particular perspective representing a more open democratic approach, as you'd expect on the part of the uh, directly elected uh, institution. And then my colleague, uh, Jutta Schulze, who's head of resources in EPRS, will moderate a, a panel discussion in reaction to what they've heard so far. And we'll be joined uh, by Heather Graby, who's director of the Open Society European Policy Institute in Brussels, and previously worked in the European Commission, by Ricardo Borges de Castro, who's associate director and head of the Europe in the World program at the EPC, the European Policy Center, Brussels-based think tank, and by Alina Dobreva, who's a policy analyst in our own members research service within EPRS, but has a specialism in European public opinion, as well as budgetary matters. So that's the lineup for this lunchtime. It's great to see everybody, and it's also great to see the 75 people so far who are online for this discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton over to Katerina Bali to ask you how you see now the state of European opinion in the context of the evolving crisis. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, for EPRS for uh, for undergoing this uh, this uh, uh, survey every uh, so so regularly because now I start as a politician and not as as a vice president uh, of the European Parliament as a politician. This is this is absolutely crucial for for us to know um, the public opinion to to get a feeling for um, how. Um, the own work is being seen and this holds true even more for the European level as you said I was active on the national level and there it you do have more direct contact uh, to the citizens um, we do at least in Germany spend more time in the constituencies which is not the case so much in Brussels um, we have much more time that we spend actually um, at uh, the seat of the plenary um, doing doing plenary and, and commission work um, so, so we do depend on this and also to get the overview of the, the whole of Europe, because usually you get feedback from your own region and you get feedback from your own um, country, but to have an overall view um, over what is going on in Europe. And this holds true even more for these times, because now we are deprived from, from what, what makes our work so special is to be in contact with citizens directly and we we cannot do this at the moment so so this is really um, a very decisive um, year to do such a survey and of course the topics that you touched upon are special too um, and 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 
extraordinary as as the t these times are. I'm not going to go into into the details of the survey, of course, because Philip Schumacher is going to do that. Um, but I think the title that you gave the survey, "A Glimpse of Certainty in Uncertain Times," is is a very um, a very interesting one, very um, to the point. Um, and I must say, I was I was um, indeed struck by some of the results, um, especially to see that that of course the majority of people are seeing are, are awaiting an, an economic impact on their lives uh, through the coronavirus crisis, but also the trust that they have in the European Union, and and I mean. Being German, I, I experienced how um, how there was really an an expectance uh, 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 the 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 what was expected of the European Union to do economically to under um, um, to to support the regions um, the countries that are most hit by the virus, but in the end, just about every member state. Was it was really awaited, and and there was kind of a fear, especially how Germans would react, being the council presidency, and to see how many are actually satisfied with the economic response, with the recovery fund, with the next generation EU, etc. I think this is very encouraging. Um, although I must say, um, I will be very curious how this develops throughout uh, the next months, uh, because at least in my home country, uh, I think that this this uh, way that the European Union is being perceived um, is changing a bit now throughout the, um, uh, the, the vaccination campaign. But these are ups and downs that we will follow up uh, on. Um, of course, which is what is very interesting is to see um, how um, the population sees the European Union as a whole, um, how how trust is there, but also the wish that the European Union um, changes, adapts to uh, to new challenges, um, also becomes more democratic. Of course, being a member of parliament, I, I salute this and I support this um, because it means, at least uh, to me, one of the components has to be to strengthen the European Parliament, but this is just my my personal opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I and and I think that it will be crucial to um, now that the conference uh, on the future of Europe is coming up, hopefully, um, that we use this as as a means to um, to pick up. Um, also, the the critics that have been um, revealed in in the survey, um, the will for for the European Union to develop more, to to change, to um, to become also closer to to the public, to to people, um, that we really take this as a as an opportunity to fulfill the promises of the European Union, because the European Union has always been a promise for the future. Um, for peace and also for economic stability and 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 coherence. So, so I'm yes, I was really intrigued by by the by the outcome of the survey, um, and I I'm I'm very curious to listen what Philip Schumacher will tell us, and I will stick to the discussion for a little while, uh, but then I'm un unfortunately have to drop out. Uh, but I I thank you for your work and and. Um, I wish you a, a good discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Vice President Barley. That's terrific um, and uh, a very nice way of segueing into, into Philip. As you say, the European Union has always been a, a promise for the future and never more perhaps than now at this particular juncture and crossroads with high expectations and also very, very real uh, problems, crisis, the crisis of coronavirus, but also uh, climate change, the digital revolution, and a whole range of other issues which are potentially transformational. Um, and this morning, the Conference of Presidents of the Parliament confirmed that the um, Interinstitutional Declaration will be signed next Wednesday, I think it is at lunchtime, uh, in the plenary. So um, that will launch the formal, that will actually be the beginning, the formal launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So this particular event, in that sense, is quite nicely timed. Over to you, Philip, to tell us what the conclusions of the Kantar survey, which I think were done in November and December, so relatively recently, show. Please. 
Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for having me today. Uh, Vice President, thank you very much for your introduction. I have to say that uh, you already told the narrative that I was planning uh, to talk about. So what I can do now is to put a few visuals on the screen to take you through that. Um, indeed, when I'm looking back at the past year and I'm now trying to share my screen, which as always is a challenge. Um, so, I think that should be there now. Can you see it? Wonderful. So, when I look back at the last year for the service that uh, Digicommunication is uh, commissioning for the European Parliament, as Anthony said, as this part of the larger interinstitutional Eurobarometer tool, we were, of course, faced with the situation that um, due to the pandemic, the restrictions, uh, the classical traditional face-to-face -face service were no longer possible. So we thought about something else. We found something else together with our contractor, with Kantar, who is accompanying us in this endeavor over the past years. Um, and we launched a series of three ad hoc online surveys in April, June, and uh, September, October, and then followed up with this Parliament 2020 with the field work in November, December. And what I would like to do in the beginning is to set a little bit the context at which we arrived with this Parliament, looking back a bit at the past year. In October 2020, and this is now from, uh, from the series of uh, the three COVID surveys. In October 2020, close to four in 10 respondents said that the coronavirus crisis had already impacted the personal income. 39% said it has already impacted. 27% said it has not yet, but they expect it to in the future and only 27 percent said it will have think believed in october that it would have no impact on their personal income at the same time we asked the question what do you think is more important or do you agree with the statement the health benefits are greater than the economic damage of the measures taken in this pandemic or the economic damage of these measures taken to fight the pandemic is greater than the health benefits. And what you can see, and that leads us to where we are today, that in the beginning of the pandemic, up to the summer, a majority of respondents said health benefits, in our view, are greater than the economic damage as a result of these measures. But after the summer, in September, October, we reached a crossing point where for the first time more people said now the economic damage might become or is greater than the health benefits. And indeed, if we're looking at the age breakdown at October of the past year, we would see that specifically young people were more worried by the economic impact of the restriction measures, specifically prevalent in the population group 25 to 34, but 55 percent said economic damage is a risk is of the measures is greater than the health benefits. What we also did, and this is also first over the past year with this new mode, survey mode, we tried out a few things and we thought it was important to look a little bit at the feelings. What feeling best describes the current emotional status? In April 2020, and then the same back in October 2020, uncertainty was the most mentioned feeling. In summer, this was more or less on a par with hope as the second most mentioned feeling. But in October, with the second week, with the second wave fully coming in, uncertainty was fully back. Now, Let's think back, and one of the big strengths of Eurobarometer is the longitudinal view, the, the view over time, the trends that we can see by asking a question, in this case, back uh, 13 years 
to 2007. Uh, question here is, do you think that the European Union is going in the right or in the wrong direction? The fat red line would be things are going in the wrong direction. The blue line, things in the European Union are going in the right direction. And what we are looking here now, just as a comparison to the economic and financial crisis of 2009, 2010. Let's take this as a comparison. And what we saw that pretty much after it started, figures, support figures for the European Union, I'm taking this as an example, plummeted. Or in other terms, from 28% people saying things are going the wrong direction, up to 55 in the course of two years. It would be reasonable, perhaps, looking back only at this instant, at this last crisis, to expect something similar. But also what uh, working with survey data has told me, expect the unexpected. Uh, so I'm talking a little bit about the unexpected events that we see now, or results that we see now. First question, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the statement the recovery plan of the EU will allow your country's economy to recover more rapidly from the negative effects of the pandemic? 72% of respondents, and this is now the parliamentary survey so taken in November, December 2020, 72% agree with this statement. Yes, we think our country's economy will recover more rapidly due to the recovery plan of the European Union. Relatively small number of respondents, 18 and six in total, 24%, less than a quarter would say they disagree with the statement. What we also can see is the spread throughout the countries is relatively small. There's a huge majority of countries between the high 60s, 70s and 80% response sharing this sentiment, the recovery plan of the European Union will help. So there is indeed a high expectation that this measure taken will have a positive effect. Going back to that one now, as again, the chart, things are going in the right direction, wrong direction. And now let's look what happened over the past one year. An increase from 32 to 39% of people saying things are going in the right direction in the European Union during the year of the pandemic, October 2019, November, December 2020. There's also more citizens saying over the same period of time that things in their country are going in the, one dire in the wrong direction than a year before, that would be the red dotted line on the top right of the chart that we are seeing here. But what's more important for me and quite crucial, and this is where this longitudinal effect or benefit of the Eurobarometer service comes into play. This is not a one-off outlier, this 32 to 39. Look back at the crisis, last crisis, 2010-2011, 19% in November 2011 of people saying things are going in the right direction. Since then, we have a continuous positive trend of people agreeing with the statement things are going in the right direction in the European Union. So I would say, I would argue through those years, through all these past 10 years, citizens in the European Union have learned a lesson, if you want, it sounds a little bit uh, off, but have understood that indeed common European solutions are better than individual national solutions. It's not only the economic crisis, what happened since then, uh, Russia, China, Trump, Brexit, everything we dealt with over the past years showed, I believe, and that is how I would interpret the data, that citizens indeed see the European Union as the right place to find better working solutions than on a national level. We see this trend replicated or mirrored in quite a lot of other standard indicators that we are having. Half of all respondents in November, December have a positive image of the European Union. This proportion has increased by 10 percentage points 
since October 2019. So plus 10 points during the first year of the pandemic and reaching the first time since 2007, again, the threshold of 50%. And again, you would see the trend that leads out of 2012 up to today. So again, I would argue not an outlier, but the continuation of a trend. And because Vice President Bali mentioned that before, of course, I expect that we might see an impact of the vaccine discussion over the past weeks in the next installment of such a survey. There might very well be countries where these positive support figures get a little bit of a dampening. I would rather trust in the general trend over time that it is not a trend reversal what is happening right now. Now let's come to Parliament. Same traditional indicator, more respondents than ever before would say, I like to see the European Parliament play a more important role than before. We're now at 63% for that. Uh, this goes up since 2015, more or less in an unbroken line. This is also not a pre-election blip, as we would have seen it, for example, in 2009, 2010, less so in 2014. This seems to be something continuing. The question, what should be main priorities for the European Parliament, brings us a little bit back again in the context of the pandemic. Because what we are seeing here for the first time is as a top item, top priority for citizens, measures to reduce poverty and social inequalities, 48%. We never had that in any of our previous surveys. We never had that in first position compared to other other policy fields. So this is very much to be seen in the context of people see, fear the economic impact this pandemic will have, that is not even yet full blown, but it will have, and they want the European Parliament as a clear expectation to focus on that. You also see when we're looking only at the main, at the first mentioned item of this question, throughout the 27 countries. 23 countries give measures to reduce poverty and social inequalities as the top mentioned item. So this is also quite convincing uh, view on this importance, on the importance of this item. The values question, another traditional indicator where we ask which values should the European Parliament defend as a matter of priority? The protection of human rights worldwide is a certain chapeau value, if you want, chapeau item uh, in this question, always ranges in place number one, unbroken even more if you want a plus of 3%. But in this context, what's important for me is the third place. Solidarity between EU member states is rising by eight points over the course of one year. We know from the surveys we took during 2020, these three COVID surveys, that there was a widespread dissatisfaction with the solidarity shown between member states. And it shows in this values question, solidarity within the EU, between the individual member states, rises in significance when it comes to defending values. Now, 72% say the country has, on balance, my country has, on balance, balance, benefited from being a member of the European Union. Also here, a similar increase over the past year. And when we are looking at the follow-up question, main reasons why you believe that your country has benefited, plus nine per percentage points, because the European Union contributes to economic growth in my country. Plus five, because membership improves the cooperation between my country and other countries within the European Union. I would see these answers not so much as 
there has been economic growth over the past year, and this is why I say so, I interpret this rather as the expectation, seed in conjunction with the response to the recovery plan, seed with the hope or with the, with the need expressed due to the feared economic consequences, we benefit because the European Union helps economic growth in my country. So it fits the overall narrative. So ending, because so far, if I end it here, uh, you might rightly say, okay, I'm painting a quite rosy picture, uh, classical institution narrative. If you want, uh, everything is good. So let's not do that. Um, another indicator, another question we started asking last year, very relevant in the context now of the Conference of the Future of Europe. The standard simple question is, are you in favor of the European Union or not? Support, yes, no, don't know. We enlarged this question a little bit and asked, you can, what, what do you agree with? I'm in favor of the European Union as it has been realized so far. Plain sailing, everything's fine. 27% agree, no change necessary. 44 say I'm rather in favor of the European Union, but not the way it has been realized until now. And 22 say I'm rather skeptical of the European Union, but I could change my opinion if there was reform. So take this together and you would have 66% who at least are expecting, hoping, wishing, calling for reform of the way the European Union is doing business. Or again, in other words, that doesn't seem to be a majority with citizens anymore that accept business as usual. Therefore, relevant for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Ending on a cautious note, I started with the impact the economic financial impact people already felt last year. We ask the question when it comes to your personal living conditions, what do you, how do you think this will be in one year's time? 52% say this will be more or less the same. Again, see this in the context of an already worsening economic environment with already felt impact on people's private personal life. And then the 52 becomes worrying, as becomes the figure 53% who say, my national economy, my country's economy will be worse in 12 months from now. So the outlook, the pessimism is clearly there that due to the pandemic, in one year's time, our economy will not look necessarily better. This increases pressure on national governments. On the one hand, there is a very high expectation in the European Union. What we could observe on the other hand, over the past year, we analyzed and measured this rally round the flag effect. So the, the, the effect of how much people would gather and support their national government in terms of crisis. And this effect was clearly present in most EU countries with a plus on average of six points over the first two months of the pandemic from March to May. Now it is slowly subsiding again. On the right side, you see uh, accumulation of data, support for national governments and the measures during the pandemic dropping by four percentage points on EU average from April to October 2020, dropping in nearly every EU member state. So pressure on national governments to deliver increases. And it's quite interesting to see some countries like the country I know best, Austria, for example, uh, where we have a drop in support, a clear significant drop in support for the government and actions taken by that government, for example, over the past days. So the question how governments deal with the raising pressure of economic change uh, 
and crisis will be quite significant for the next month. And Anthony, I'm done. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you very much to Katerina Bali for setting the scene so eloquently. And thank you for, to Philip Schulmeister for unpacking the detail um, in such a precise and, and clear way and some very interesting messages that come out of that. The interaction between the EU and uh, public opinion and its legitimacy and support, of course, is something that we in Brussels think a great deal about all the time. And I should just take the opportunity to mention that our next EPRS event, which will be um, a week on Monday, uh, on Monday the 15th of March, again at lunchtime, uh, we'll see Professor Vivian Schmidt, uh, well known to you, um, I, I imagine, as the author of A Democracy in Europe, talk about her new book, uh, The Legitimacy Crisis in Europe, which looks at the Eurozone. And she's also going to compare and contrast that with the coronavirus crisis and how that's been handled. So we're very privileged to have one of the world's leading political scientists. And indeed, her book, Democracy in Europe, was chosen by the Parliament as one of the 100 books on Europe to remember, talking about her new book, which is um, just out. And that'll be, as I say, next month, uh, a week on Monday, the 15th of March. So um, we've got just under an hour for discussion. We've got exactly 100 people online. Um, and plenty of opportunity for people to come forward with questions and thoughts from the floor. But before that, as you think about questions that you would like to ask, I'm going to hand over to Jutta Schulze, who's going to invite uh, three discussants to comment and reflect upon what they've just heard. Over to you, Jutta. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, and um, hello to the almost 100 people which are online. Please stay with us. We're trying to make this a a vivid, uh, lively discussion, and you're, of course, invited um, already and as of now um, again to submit your comments and questions. I have the pleasure to moderate the uh, discussing, uh, the discussion with which we kick off in a moment. However, I would like to pass on one question to Philip, um, who so effectively analyzed this last uh, Eurobarometer before we dive into our discussion, um, which we received already through the chat. So I'm happy that um, we are in interactive mode already. I read it out to you, Philip, if you allow. Which measures were taken to ensure that the participants included in the study were representative of the broader European population in terms of example given education, social, socioeconomic status or political affiliation? I think you can reassure us on this front, please. Yes, I can. Although I have to, uh, I have to admit that I really hate the methodology question. <laughs> <laughs> we can take it at the end. <laughs> we can, we can take it at the end. No, but the Eurobarometer has. Uh, I know it's very regularly. <laughs> the, very, the Eurobarometer has a very well established uh, methodology ensuring representativity throughout uh, the whole sample construction throughout the whole field work, throughout the waiting process afterwards to make sure uh, that uh, indeed the respondents uh, compare correctly um, to, the, to the statistical facts that we have on the composition of the European, uh, of the European population. I would say, if you're interested, drop me a mail and uh, I send you a technical note on the, on, the, on the methodology of the sample construction and that would be the easiest. But so far, I can, what I can do here now is assure that every measure according to state of the art is taken to ensure representativity in the population of the survey. Thank you very much, Philippe. I then have the pleasure to um, Thank once more Heather, Ricardo and Alina for joining us today. I will represent and just mention your current function because I saw around 30 of our participants joined a few minutes late and missed the already rich introduction um, which uh, Anthony presented. So Heather Graby, you're currently the director of the Open Society European Policy Institute, a think tank based in Brussels, and many know you uh, or knew you already in your former function as deputy director of the CER. Ricardo Borges de Castro is since a short while, I believe, the associate director uh, and head of the Europe in the World Programme of the European Policy Centre, equally, of course, based in Brussels. And Alina Dobreva is my uh, kind colleague from the uh, Members Research Service, uh, our Budgetary Policies Unit, uh, and 
uh, researches and writes um, notably on issues such as the EU budget and public opinion. <laughs> voilà, many thanks. Um, we have heard um, a very nice narrative um, from Philip, and I think we all want to believe that this is a generally a positive trend that we see, that generally the positive image of the EU uh, has been boosted recently um, due to, in view of the circumstances of this um, extraordinary crisis that we all still live in and, and, and suffer from. Uh, I think we want to believe this. We also heard, however, the, the BMOL, of course, there is a clear uh, call for reform. We heard 44% of citizens said business as usual is not what they really want. And we interestingly, and that's for the task list of the parliament, have a new priority which emerged for the first time ever, if I if I uh, listened carefully, uh, Philip, which is the, the fight against poverty and inequalities. Not too surprising, um, of course, uh, in, in a health crisis. But the question that, I think the main question that I want to ask to our uh, discussants is, how do we translate these results? Um, what is the main message? What are the messages now for EU policy making? Heather, do you want to kick off? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jutten. And thank you, Philippe, for this very good overview of, of quite a lot of data that's available in the parameter. So I want to bring out two uh, key findings that policymakers really need to pay attention to, and because neither of them has a clear answer. Um, so the first one is this finding that 48% of respondents think that the main priority of the European Parliament should be to fight poverty and social inequalities. Now, that um, sounds very logical in a pandemic. It might well be something that uh, respondents would say, yes, that should be top priority in any survey about any institution, whether at EU level, national level, regional or local level, because many people in Europe are suffering from the um, social and economic consequences and, of course, psychological consequences of the pandemic. And we've seen, of course, a very interestingly in the survey, um, the degree of pessimism that a large Large chunk of the population feels um, and of course the distribution across different member states is, is itself interesting and important too. But I think the real dilemma for policymakers is how to respond to this call for help, for social protection, for poverty fighting measures, for social inequalities, when at EU level there aren't so very many measures. There is, of course, the EU budget, but it's only 1% of EU GDP. There's, of course, now the recovery funds, which are a lot bigger, but they are mostly being spent at national level, according to EU-wide priorities, and the Commission has to look at the national plans and so on, but nevertheless, it's national government. And that's also been the case over the past decade since um, the financial and then economic crisis and euro crisis uh, which caused a lot of people to fall into poverty and, and the big problem i think we still have is that um, the public has long perceived as we see also in other eurobarometer surveys the eu as the level that is um, demanding austerity um, and the national governments as the ones that are handing out the social assistance and and social security so, um, as you say in, in Germany, in German, we see the Peitsche at, at European level, but the Zuckerbrot is at national level. So uh, there's a real problem with a mismatch that the EU is the driver of austerity and only the, the only good news comes from national level. So uh, this is where I think actually it's time to think um, as we emerge from this pandemic, hopefully over the next years, um, about how the EU level could also respond to this demand. Uh, one thing that I think it would be very important to look at more is Europe-wide unemployment insurance, which would give people the sense of a, sa a safety net that is guaranteed at EU level. And of course, that's especially relevant given the normally outside lockdown circumstances, normally uh, mobility of workers is something that, of course, we want to promote in the single market. It's, it's very important for the economy um, and also for, for, for people. Um, so I think that's, that's one dilemma that I, I would pull out. The other one is um, the one about um, the environment and climate. Now, this is also a tricky one um, because um, what we saw um, two years ago in the 2019 parameter, combating climate change and preserving the environment, oceans and biodiversity ranked as the highest priority. This year, around a similar proportion of people, around a third, prioritise measures to protect the environment and biodiversity, but it now ranks fourth in the list. 
And this is in line with the findings of the standard Eurobarometer, which saw a decrease in the proportion of Europeans saying that the environment and climate change is one of the most important issues facing the European Union. Now, the difficulty here is not that um, uh, somehow it's lost uh, popularity. I, I think there are many activists out there, particularly the younger generation, um, and we're also seeing that still around a third of Europeans prioritise uh, the environment. But it's that now, unlike 2019, the EU has a very big and comprehensive programme of work on this, the European Green Deal, and a very large number of measures that will be rolled out um, over the next months. Between now and June, um, the EU is going to have, I think it's 13 plus three really significant measures coming um, initiatives European from the emissions trading scheme to uh, maritime fuel aviation cars and so on and three more after the summer on buildings and so on so what's about to hit the public in addition to all the news about vaccines and so on is a huge amount of work and really significant measures that will change their lives at EU level but they may not be realizing that that's going to happen and so my my key takeaway there for um policymakers is it's time to start explaining the European Green Deal in real world terms so that people understand where it's going to lead to and that in fact the problems of poverty and social inequality which they are rightly and understandably prioritizing right now could actually be uh, alleviated uh, thanks to a well-run Green Deal which delivers a fairer economy with more opportunities for jobs um, in new sectors um, and also more dynamism um, in a sustainable economy and that that message is not getting across in fact if anything what we're seeing is a lot of populists who are now saying you're going to have more restrictions climate measures mean more restrictions on your choices and on your freedoms um, and we see that in the run-up to the German election campaign at federal level this year um, and I think we will see it also in the French presidential election next year so my my message there would be policymakers pay a lot of attention to the link between social uh, equality and um, the European Green Deal and explain it in terms that the public can understand. Thank you. Thank you for your very forceful and very clear message. Heather, Ricardo, can I pass on to you? Absolutely. Would you agree with, with Heather and what is the main message you distill? From thank heard from the thank you, Jutta, and thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean, I think I'd like to, to make a few reflections. I, I agree with some points that uh, that um, Heather, Heather raised. I think my first comment overall on the survey, and if I want to look at the, even the title of the survey, let's say, uh, you know, a glimpse of certainty in a sea of, let's say, of uncertainty, is really how wise the European public is. I think if you take this survey as a whole, tells you a very sophisticated, uh, you know, look at how the world and how Europe um, is evolving. Because on what it's not, I mean, if you look at just one part of the survey, you might get uh, the impression that everything is okay. If you look at other part of the survey, you might have an impression everything is wrong. So I think you need to look at in its in its wholeness to actually to be able to to take out really how sophisticated this is because. As, as Philip was saying, Europeans are hopeful, but they're also concerned about their future. They think that the EU can provide solutions, but they also think that sometimes it's not going in the right way. So I think that this message, which is a very common sense and very I mean, I mean, reasonable message, I think it's very important uh, uh, for us, I think for us to take. I mean, on some aspects of the survey, I'm really not surprised that governments and national governments, even if then Philip Etienne put that the rally around the flag, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, numbers which were very interesting. I mean, in general, and I think this is fair to say, states and governments, I mean, not only in Europe, but all over the world in this pandemic have failed. I mean, there was a failure of preparedness. There was a failure of competence on how to handle a situation like this. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, a pandemic would never, would not always be a difficult uh, issue to solve, but we would knew that these things could happen and we could have been uh, better prepared. I think I'm not surprised there that, that Europeans will have a harsh, um, you know, judgment on their governments. And, and actually, maybe then last year, when Europe really did very well, you know, after the summer, you know, with a, with a new generation EU, with all the efforts that were made to actually to find European solutions, that also reflects the positive trend that, uh, that, that Philip um, uh, also mentioned, that this trend of a positive view on the EU is actually something that, that has been going on on a, on a longitudinal um, uh, basis. I think, however, now that uh, in the current circumstances, and this was already alluded, so I don't want to spend much time there, the vaccination rollout is really a litmus test to this message. Because in a sense, 
uh, you know, the, the, the vaccination strategy was told to Europeans, if we do this together, we'll do it better. And now, I mean, if really the, the, we need to wait until the end of the process, but if this, this, you know, this experience fails, I, don't, I, I, I might agree with Philip, this will not probably break the trend, but, but might bend the trend and will make you know, future arguments of trying or of EU added value more difficult from a political point of view. So I think we should all of us here put our minds and hearts on this vaccination strategy and roll out. And this, I mean, this needs to go well for us to be able to, to, to actually then, and moving now to the last reflection or more sort of future oriented to, on how to tap to this result. I think for me, there, there are two elements that are very relevant. The first one is what, Philip, what you mentioned about youth and how young people are seeing this crisis affecting them economically. So the, the, you know, the 25 to 30, 34 year old age, uh, you know, they say that they feel that's very affected. If you look at it, these people in 2011 were 15 to 24 years old. So they have already been hit once. You know, in in their lifetime, as 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 adolescents or you know young people or you know already starting the labor market or leaving university. So I think this is a demographic that we really need to look very hard. I mean, European institutions need to really to focus on 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 this group because I mean, again, we have had discussions on lost generation. This is certainly not the lost generation because they are highly educated, they are highly motivated. But we really need to pay attention to to, to, to what is happening. Uh, I think to them. The other elements that I would look is actually not so much to the 44% that won't change. I would add the 22 that you did as well, Philip. The, the other 22 that say, I'm rather skeptical, but if there is radical reform, I'll be able to make it to change my mind. I think this 66% um, uh, result of people that might like the EU even more if there is reform, um, I think we need to look into this. Of course, if we break it down, what might mean reform for a Portuguese might be different from a Dutch person or for a German. Okay, so and in the breaking down, we also need to, to bear this to bear this in mind. But from this will take me, I would say, to the last to last point that I wanted to do. We should not be, I mean, if if we are, I think now if we if there's another pandemic coming, I think we'll be better prepared for it. But I think there needs to be an effort, EU-wide effort on strategic foresight and preparedness and, and, and really stepping up the work that we are already doing in trying to prepare ourselves for the next crisis, because they will come. We are at a state where crisis becomes more and more permanent, and I think we need to be better prepared also for the resiliency of our societies. And I think we can have Europeans together with us to do this, but we really need to actually to respond to some of, 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 of their concerns with practical examples. And that's why I think, again, the vaccination rollout strategy is crucial in, in this respect. We shouldn't uh, downplay it. I think Results also tell us that there is a lot of potential that we can use here to 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 you know to, for some policies that that Heather uh, just mentioned. And so I think let's look at these results, like I was saying, and I'll finish here as really a very sophisticated look at how you know European politics and European integration is going on, and what can we take out of out of out of these results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, for points you made, which were very complimentary to others and, and uh, enrich very usefully our, our discussion. Alina, please. Hello to everyone. Uh, first, I want to start actually with one remark to what the Vice President Barley was saying. She was saying how important it is to have uh, public opinion surveys, especially in these uh, crucial times that we cannot have, uh, or politicians, she was talking from the point of view of politicians, that they cannot have as much direct contact with uh, the citizens as they usually do. I want to uh, see this point from a pollster perspective, from a researcher point of view, as I used to work as a pollster before joining the EPRS. And I want to say that we really should say a big thank you to Philip and his unit for managing to provide such data because I do understand how difficult it is in these times to collect data. And as a, as a former pollster, I do understand all the hurdles that they had to go through in order to do that. And that's uh, that had always been a difficult profession, but now it's more difficult. And 
Also to add that, I used to work also on the Eurobarometer from <laughs> a poster point of view and to reassure the person who asked the question about the representativeness that actually Eurobarometer were one of the most painful uh, surveys because the criteria of uh, representativeness was quite high. So you can be reassured that the standards are really high on the collection of the data. Now I want to add uh, only I agree uh, with plenty of the things that Heather and Ricardo already mentioned. I will point uh, your focus to one uh, other aspect of the survey in order to uh, let uh, after that um, more space for a discussion and for questions. So as uh, you mentioned, I also work on budgetary issues and I want to point the direction to the EU recovery plan and to what the survey shows as um, expectations of this recovery plan. As Philip said, the 72% of uh, EU citizens believe that it will help uh, the recovery plan will help the economies to rapidly um, deal with the adverse effects of the pandemic. That's quite the overwhelming expectation. Um, he also showed how it's widespread among the countries. It's really way beyond the uh, majority of uh, citizens that think that. I just uh, want to point on this thing that I am a bit afraid of this overly positive uh, expectation of this. And just to mention also what Heather very rightly said, that the EU budget is only 1%, approximately 1% of the GDP of the country, so it's rather small thing and we expect a lot from this. But she also mentioned that the recovery plan is bigger, which is not exactly the case. It's focused on few years, but as an amount, it's not. So that also, um, I'm not so much pointing to get the mistake you're not a budgetary person so it's just an example that there is a hype there is a huge expectation of the magnitude and of the role that this uh, recovery plan can add to the european to the european union's instrument and tools to help uh, the member states uh, i also looked at the data of the countries that are more uh, most hopeful in terms of the eu recovery plan and these are Malta and Ireland. And these are also the countries that are most optimistic about the future of the EU. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, the countries that are least, and I say that in inverted commas because still two thirds of the people are uh, very supportive of the recovery plan. So the countries are France and, fin and Finland. They are amongst the least optimistic about the future of the EU. So we don't know what is the causal direction, whether the optimism makes them look at the recovery plan in a better view or the other way around, but there is, there is some uh, overlap or a link between do, these two questions. And also what uh, Philip was saying about the emotional context in which we live through this crisis, and that there is a lot of hope, hope being almost the first, but still keeping the second as a second most important emotion. We see this very, um, I see this uh, response to the EU recovery plan as a very emotionally charged response to, uh, uh, as a support to this plan. Uh, we actually don't see quite a lot of um, uh, differences in terms of socio-demographic um, support around this um, uh, uh, on the question on the recovery fund. So it's uh, quite widely accepted in terms of social groups, just as in terms of uh, in terms of uh, member states. One other aspect of the answer is uh, what I found very interesting is that usually when we look at budget related questions, the share of don't know answers is quite high. In this question, we had only 4% of people who are saying uh, we don't know. It also shows that there is a lot of willingness to answer, but not so much in the rational, judging the numbers, the amounts way of thinking, but much more in the emotional way. And that's why people are much more ready to answer this question. Uh, also, because there are so few don't know answers, uh, talking about a plan that in December were still 
very much in the preparation. Even now, we don't have the national governments, uh, all of them submitted to their national plans. So this is something that hasn't even started, that is still in preparation, and there are so few don't know answers. So we see this, um, this answer here in the context of hope and emotionally charged. This is important to note, I think, from um, the policymakers' perspective, because for me, that's a danger. That's a danger because emotional expectations are even more difficult to meet than rational ones. They are based on uh, the hopes, and the hopes are much more uh, difficult to meet, especially in the crisis uh, situation. So I would say that this recovery plan is based on borrowed money, but also it's based on borrowed support from the citizens. We need to really uh, look at the, uh, at the success of the support for it, also in the terms of very high pressure on the Commission and on the member states, because they are partners in that, to uh, to actually implement this plan in a, in a really good way. The scrutiny there will be even higher than on the usual budgetary instruments, because the hype and the expectations are very, very high here. Um, so, uh, and, and I would say that usually citizens are quite critical on the point of uh, EU spending money. We see over the years in previous uh, studies that when, they, when citizens are asked if there is value for money on EU spending, they're quite critical on that. Even though we see on other questions that they, the citizens say that they benefit from that, they're still quite critical. So I will stop here in order to allow for questions and get back to the discussion with the other issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alina, also for uh, zooming in a little bit further, including on particular geographical um, uh, elements here, which are um, indeed uh, very interesting. Um, we have uh, received one uh, further question. I'm afraid <laughs> it's again for Philip. <laughs> um, I, I read it out to you. Uh, Due to the COVID-19 measures, the government's uh, support is dropping almost everywhere. I suppose it means support in general for national governments is dropping. Uh, has this been taken into account? Has, has uh, drafting the survey, did you note what could or should be done by governments to change that path? I suppose you would not have wanted to do that, but maybe you explain how the, how the survey was designed. Well, we did not have a question on uh, choosing measures uh, citizens would like to see in order to come overcome the crisis in this survey in here. So that is unfortunately not an analytical factor that I can now come uh, up with in this context. Um, no. Uh, the, one, the one thing that I found maybe interesting is um, I, I just maybe quickly share this, try to share the screen here again. This is also from, um, from a counter, uh, from a counter survey that they, that they did. Um, what do countries across the world uh, try to do as measures, interventions against the crisis? And what we can see is countries like Belgium, France, Italy, Spain uh, favor to a large degree fiscal policy tax relief as a key action. Other countries, Germany among them from the European set if you want, but specifically also Australia and Japan strongly support public investment uh, for growth. I found this. Uh, I found this not uninteresting. A little bit also to 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 look at this a little bit more global comparison. What can be done? Because uh, one of the things that I strongly believe is um, two issues as of now will emerge clearly above all. The one, the track record of managing the pandemic, and the second is the path towards economic recovery. And while the former is about data and communication, the latter is clearly about 
courage and uh, and the structural change. And I think this is what both Heather and Ricardo were also touching upon before. There is a chance now to do something with the tools that have been put in place. And the big question is whether that is actually going to happen or yeah, the challenge, maybe not the question. Yeah, I, I think, thank you, Philip. I think the common thread we, we saw through all three um, interventions uh, was the issue of the the high expectations and the the, the, the fear about an expectation gap um, that uh, may widen it's been always there um, I suppose but it, it may widen further and and become a real issue um, Heather you you pointed particularly uh, to the need for better clearer, uh, communication with citizens and the interface with the European Green Deal. Ricardo, you reminded us of the, the, the young generation. I think the term COVID generation has already been coined, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I think uh, those concerned also use it. You talked about the skeptical group and, of course, the need for foresight. And Alina, you um, remind us, reminded us of the over 70% of citizens having now hopes related to the recovery fund. You know, and I think we're all a little bit wondering, do they know the exact mechanism of this recovery fund? Are these hopes realistic? And so on and so forth. So at our doorsteps now uh, is the, uh, thank you for the good news, Anthony, is the, the, the kickoff of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, how do we use this now in an intelligent, effective manner? how we well we will not have a large influence but how can this now be used this this uh, this uh, very precious tool in in catalyzing all, all these and and in 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 making sure that uh, citizens feel listened to and feel responded to um what is your reaction to the, to, to this thank you ricardo do you want to come in first Sure. Yeah, I can start. I mean, I think the first reflection is that finally it's going to, going to start, right? So I think that's that's the first uh, good news, and, and I'm glad that Anthony was able to to share that. Also, I mean, with all of us, that as of next week, the first uh, the first event. I mean, I, I think you know, from a per personal preference, I would have never called it a conference on future of Europe. I would have called it a few a forum on the future of Europe because a forum would have been more inclusive, more bottom up, and would have been sort of maybe we would have been able to do more of a festival of ideas on the future of Europe. So that would have been my preference um, to, to in this, instead of just a, a conference that sounds, you know, very bureaucratic, very structured, very top down. And, and, and I mean, and I think also the past few months in all this haggling around, you know, how would this uh, be sort of set up shows a little bit uh, that problem. But anyway, it's going to start. And I think that's the, the most important. I mean, very quickly, I think it's really a good opportunity to discuss uh, the future of Europe. I think, I mean, my think tank, the EPC would be very much involved and, and then participating in, in sort of in, in so many of uh, the events or and, and you know trying to contribute to this discussion i would maybe refer to the two points that, that i made um, initially just to give a little bit of follow-up i think on, on on the younger generation i mean you mentioned you know um a COVID generation i mean they already like i said this COVID generation had already been hit by the financial economic crisis so i don't know what kind of generation but i mean they are i think they they they, they really they are strong and resilient, but I think in terms of policy making, what we need to start doing, I think also in our, I mean, in a general term, except for all the policies and measures that we need to do to on a daily, on a day-to-day -day business, that is, that is to to manage, you know, either you know uh, problems or or issues that are sort of immediate. I think overall our policies should be thought out long term. And one of the new elements of long-term thinking uh, on on sort of generations is this concept of intergenerational fairness. So I think our policies need to start to have a yardstick or at least have some criteria for us to be to be able to judge. And I think this enters very well into what Adder was saying on, 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 on the Green Deal or you know, climate change uh, related uh, policies that we actually we start introducing this idea is this policy or are, are these measures intergenerationally fair? And there are a few projects ongoing. Uh, I mean, in Portugal, for example, at the Gulbenkian Foundation, also with the School of International Futures. So, I mean, there's a lot of things being done in this in this respect. And I think probably this should be something that the Conference on the Future of Europe and the European Parliament probably should should take up. I think the second one has to do really with this, you know. This, this nexus between preparedness and resilience, where you know strategic anticipation or strategic foresight comes in. This is something that probably it's going to be hard to do, but it needs to be done. It's going to be hard to do because 
probably there will not be so many resources for this because you know member states in the U.S. we have so many problems to solve that there might not be enough resources for this. But also in a, in many circumstances, this is this will not be a visible process. And so maybe because it's not visible and you cannot sell it, I mean, it will only be really visible when it's needed and is either there or it's not there. I mean, if it's there, it's probably served its purposes and we will be able to weather crisis better. If it's not there, then everybody will notice, OK, we have, we have not learned the lessons from COVID or from all the other crises. But I nevertheless think and the efforts are being done. I mean, by the Commission, with the new Vice President on foresight, by the European Parliament through this, uh, you know, the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, the ESPAS, that tries to build foresight capability. But we really need to be better at anticipating, you know, um, crisis or events that might have the consequences that we have. And I finish with a number. If we just think that the IMF in October last year projected that the economic loss uh, due to the pandemic would amount to almost $28 trillion, and that to maybe prepare to some diseases this, of this type that we only need to spend billions, I think this all, I mean, I think this is enough. I think we need really to understand that if we prepare, if we have the systems in place, maybe we won't be able to, to you know, just to, to weather, I mean, not to, to feel a crisis, but we'll be better off. So that will be my message that the, the Conference on the Future of Europe also needs to look into sort of systems within our you know, institutions, member states that can actually help us be better prepared for this type of events. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, uh, Alina or Heather. Please do dive in. Yes, I'm happy to come in here. So um, it's a real pity. I think this Conference on the Future of Europe is going to be a, a massive missed opportunity. Um, partly that's because of um, accident, that uh, it's very hard to have um, a wide ranging citizens um, consultation and, and a range of, of, of citizens assemblies, which was one of the original ideas. Um, that would have been a great thing to do, but um, almost impossible to do that entirely online. You lose a great deal and it, it's just so much more complicated to do it. So um, the very interesting experiments and important experiments in deliberative democracy that have been happening in many of the member states, France, of course, the Grand Débat, but also Ireland, Poland, Spain. There's a lot to learn from that at EU level about going beyond representative democracy, important though it remains, I hasten to assure the MEPs. Um, it's still important but when you're trying to deal with a multi-generational um, issue, as, as Ricardo was just pointing out, such as uh, climate change and, and the need to move to a sustainable circular economy, um, there's only so much you can do when the parameters um, set for governance um, are, are, are elections every four or five years and when uh, business, many businesses are, are just looking at quarterly profits you need to have a much longer time frame and that's the kind of thing the conference on the future of europe could have taken up and actually um put to much more um integrated intergenerational and uh, and socially inclusive citizens panels um that could have been really representative of the population so that's going to be impossible and meanwhile of course it's been massively shortened because uh, president macron wants it out of the way before the french presidential elections next year um a plus i won't even start on all of the bureaucratic complexities of having six presidents and, and so on. But what I think it does show is, is two things that need to really, it, it perhaps could be a starting point for two very important conversations at EU level which have been missing. One is what kinds of dimensions of democracy we need now in the 21st century faced by these massive and, mu and very complex issues of the combination of digital transformation and the need to move to um, a circular and sustainable economy. Um, a massive systems change as that we we are actually experiencing is bound to leave people behind it's bound to create, create a huge amount of insecurity and it will be very easy to blame the eu for all of the problems that emerge if the eu level is seen as responsible uh, for um, only the measures and the restrictions and the new laws and regulations and taxes and not for um, looking out for social fairness intergenerational fairness and also global fairness um, the big blind spot of the european green deal is external policies in fact and, and i think that's a Thing. The EU needs to show that um, it's not aiming for a protectionist 
um, we're going to sell all of our new nice new green products into your markets approach that that really wouldn't work so it's a critical moment for europe to show that to to show that at eu level there is real concern about the vulnerable workers who've been very much um, harmed during the current crisis for example all of the migrant workers who pick the oranges and the tomatoes uh, which have kept the food chain working during this pandemic we haven't had food shortages thanks to a large number of people risking their lives to be out there in the fields and and in the supply chain um and also the the the, the, the essential workers who are on the worst kinds of contracts the least um, job security the least social security um many of them in extremely precarious tradition uh, positions but they are the ones who've kept everything going in the care homes uh, sweeping the streets uh keeping all of these essential services working in their very low paid and precarious um, circumstances so that these are issues that the conference on the future of europe needs to pick up and look at is how do we have a whole of society approach to the digital and green transformation? Um, and I think that's far more important, frankly, than uh, the institutional squabbling that's going on at the moment. And there needs to be some real leadership now. Thank you very much, uh, um, Heather. And uh, yeah, I like very much your proposal that this could be indeed a first step because I think we're all concerned seeing the 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 timeline now foreseen for the for this conference on the future of Europe, Alina, is this now a possibility to to mobilize the twenty two percent? Was it Philip the twenty two percent in principle, uh, agreeing with the direction, uh, saying EU goes in the right direction, but not entirely convinced and wanting wanting to see changes? No, forty four percent actually. Oh. Forty four percent uh, are rather see, we're in favor volatile times. <laughs> Change and 22 okay. are rather skeptical, but could come back if. And the Ricardo is completely right that these two need to be seen together. That is the that is the target, if you want. That's the movable target, and moving target, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in absolute volatile times. And sorry, my my optimism came through here. Please, Alina. Yes, I think that uh, the option of taking this uh, the 40 or so percent uh, on board, uh, we usually talk more about informing the citizens, telling them about uh, EU policies, and that's the approach of taking people on board. But indeed, there is a time also to look with more focus on the other side of the communication, actually listening to the citizen. And uh, indeed, it's, uh, it was a great idea to have uh, a more debating uh, type of uh, conference of Europe and involving more citizens in the communication mix. And it's, it's really such a bad uh, timing for this, uh, for this uh, pandemic to happen. Not that there is any good timing for such a thing, but in terms of uh, the Conference of um, Future of Europe, it's really the time when we had to have face-to-face -face communication and gathering in huge groups. I uh, want to actually slightly uh, be the devil's advocate and um, ask here Ricardo and Heather, they were talking about long term, but um, uh, I think it was yesterday that I read in the news uh, something on the GDPR uh, regulation that it already needs to be changed according to experts. and. I want to, to actually ask them to what extent they see uh, this uh, short term versus uh, long term policy making, especially in the digital uh, era that we are, that is speeding everything and uh, how we can combine both of those uh, trends. Uh, because it's uh, definitely we're working in uh, in context that is already very different from when the EU was established and the speed of development of policies and the speed of development of every social economic process is already diff different and the need for change in the regulation is also different. That, of course, doesn't mean that uh, I'm in favour of um, responding to uh, citizens' expectations in every on every bleep 
because it was very wise what we were discussing earlier that uh, all these public opinion changes they need to be seen in their longitude and the longer trends and especially when we look at eu level uh, data that's a combination of uh, national data and especially in the context of covid we saw that at the difficult moments or the the highest um, uh, moments uh, of um, in health uh, terms of the crisis were coming with different timing in different countries. Also, the lockdowns were with different timing. So when we look at the overall EU picture, that can be um, in terms of timing very uh, dependent on the very distorted timings of uh, the countries. But still, we need to see these dynamics of uh, the policy response that is needed also in the terms of the short term necessities that current situation demands. Thank you, Thank you very much. Is there a, a reply or additional comment from sure, either? I don't know if, if, if Heather wants to go ahead or otherwise I, I don't mind. Yeah, Heather, ladies first. Please go ahead, Ricardo. I'll go. Then thanks very much. I mean, I think, it, well, um, um, Alina, what, what you just said is basically it's music to my ears, right? In a sense that precisely because things are moving much faster, you need to be much better prepared to face this type of environment, which means that then you need, to, again, I, I mean, I go back, I, I know that I sound like a broken record, but I've been saying this for the past five or six years, and I'll continue to say the same thing. We need to be better prepared. We need to have systems in place. I mean, we're not always going to get it right. Don't get me wrong. And I mean, you mentioned GDPR. I mean, it was proposed in what, 2012? And only in 2016 was approved. And now it's already, um, I think these are the dates. I mean, this, this I, I, I might be wrong on the dates, but it's something like this. And now in 2021, it's already outdated. I mean, if you actually have a rolling system that is functional, that either you know in each institution or that brings the, 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 the all institutions together to continuously think and scan the horizon. I mean, I have nothing against the, the short term. I think the short term is important because it's where we live, right? We live in the short, I mean, we live today. It's, uh, so in that sense, it's on the present day, but we also need to anticipate, not only because we wanna be better um, you know, uh, prepared when something wrong happens, like a pandemic, or we want to leave a better world to our, you know, to our, to our, you know, to our children, to our grandchildren. You know, so I think in this respect, if we are actually able to keep track of the changes, it's like you say. I mean, today it's it's a little bit, and and, and Heather mentioned this uh, sort of slightly on the, on the strategic autonomy debate now on foreign policy. We are having a discussion on strategic autonomy for today, not for 2030 or for 2035 or 2040. So by the time that we have built all the strategic autonomy that we need for 2025, it's going to be already outdated for the rest. Of, you know, so this is again the thing that might be. I know that we can't be doing. You know that this is not an easy exercise. That it takes um, you know a lot of resources. That but I mean there are resources. It's just a matter of you make you make a priority and you allocate resources to be able to be able to do this. So I think. And now there's actually, a, you know, there, there are more arguments to, to, to be able to do these things because, I mean, foresight gain or strategic anticipation gains more relevance throughout the years because of the successive crisis that we always say, oh, what a big surprise. I mean, so this is really not the, the way forward. And final remark, if we really wanted to continue to be democracies, we need to really, um, you know, invest on anticipatory democracy. Because I mean, there's in the, in the in the community of foresight, there's this term that it's called anticipatory governance. I mean, this any country can do. I mean, anyone in the world can do anticipatory governance. Anticipatory democracy is much harder because you are subject to much more pressure because you have structural electoral cycles, which I want to maintain as 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 a European. I don't want to change the systems that we have. I want them to adapt, you know, to this to, to this reality that moves faster. So instead of changing democracy, we need to change the way we do democracy, right? And I think here, of course, the parliament plays a, plays a key role. So this, this is always my plea. I mean, let's be better prepared. Let's think ahead of what might be the things. And of course, I mean, there will always be times that we're going to be surprised. And there are always things that will be outdated. But that's just the nature of things. But we can do at least a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it, you're very convincing, Ricardo. I think what what we what you, you tackle is here and... and, and uh, concerns, of course, the eternal dilemma about the, the political cycles and the, the quick wins in the political life which can be made 
and um, you know um, the seeing the more long term dimension and gaining support for those. And um, I think we're very much in that struggle on all levels. I wanted to come back. You made the quite strong remark in your initial statement, saying all states failed. Oh, I hope I caught you right. Um, has this, <laughs> has this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, has this changed um, the public attitudes to the role of, of the state, you think, in society and economy? Question to, to all of you. Is, is, is this a transformational uh, process we are, we are observing here? And where is this leading to, in your view? I could come in here. Um, Yes, I think it's it's a very important moment when people are looking to the state for protection and they are expecting to see um, uh, a, a, a very impressive and and reassuring um, uh, response from several levels of government. And that's why I think actually, I mean, we were talking today about um, a, a survey that was done in November last year, and um, I'm sure that events since then have affected things, both the arrival of the vaccine, but also all of the problems with rollout of the vaccine. Um, and so people are are seeing both the capabilities of the state at different levels very clearly. They're also seeing the limits of capability. They're seeing both seeing both failures of politics, where sometimes political blockages and failure to agree is uh, preventing um, very important things from happening. They're also seeing what actually amazing things can happen, that the logistics can work for um, so many people to be vaccinated with a, um, a product that has to be stored at um, extremely cold temperatures, for example. So um, these are important lessons to be learned. And I, I think that the key thing now is um, not to keep blaming citizens for not trusting government institutions. Uh, there's a tendency looking at all of the surveys, and this comes up in Eurobarometer, but also many of surveys on trust, that um, there is a secular decline in citizens' um, trust in institutions, in politics, particularly party party uh, political parties um, have uh, lower trust ratings than estate agents um, and lawyers in quite a number of countries these days. Um, and so uh, and, and institutions as a whole, they're trusted in some places, for example, in Germany, um, the independent institutions like the Bundesbank are still very much trusted, but many others are not. And in this pandemic, people are, are looking at the health system and the health institutions and wondering what they can trust in the future. So it's a real test. It's a uh, almost a, a test of breaking point of our governance structures, our politics, our democracies, more and more for, for all the reasons that Ricardo just gave, capacity for foresight, and also um, who can do what at which level. In Europe, we're quite proud of having a um, uh, uh governance architecture with governance at many different levels, which at times can be expensive and time consuming and rather slow to act. And it's particularly slow in a crisis, as we've seen. Um, it's really difficult to get 27 member states to agree together, especially if some of them want to go rogue um, on various issues. Um, on the other hand, the, the great uh, strength of the European Union is that what it decides has staying power. The fact that we have a community of law, despite, again, attempts to undermine it by certain member states, but we have a community of law, we can create binding um, agreements, uh, which other regions simply don't have the capacity to do. Um, and of course, we have resources to back them up. Um, and so having that EU level, this is the moment when it really needs to prove its added value, not as a crisis response mechanism, because I don't think the EU will ever be good at that. There's too much defense of sovereignty by member states to give the kinds of powers to the EU level that would be needed for the EU to be a proper crisis response mechanism. But to do often the crisis cleanup and putting in place the structures and institutions and policies and funding that will be needed to prevent the next crisis, that's what the EU can do. That's what it's really good at. And I think that's what the Conference on the Future of Europe, but also um, uh, institutions like the European Parliament should really think about doing now as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Heather. Uh, uh, Jutta, Ricardo, please. Yeah. Just yeah. very briefly, I didn't say that all of them failed, but I think there was a general failure Right. Uh, in, I mean, in the majority of states, not only in Europe, but across the globe. I mean, if you look and the studies that have so far have been published, that have been looking at this, what they found that states that did better, either they had had a previous experience with a situation such as this. Uh, the second element is that they are internally cohesive. So it's, it's easier to pass a message of, of and mobilize, mobilize people. And the third element is that they were technically competent. So they had competent, I mean, there was technical competence to deal with this in the health public system, in the, how the, the government works. So these are our elements. 
But I, I mean, I didn't want to sort of this to, to be more on the, on the negative um, side or end on a nev negative note. I think there's also some silver linings in, the, in this crisis. And if we just look at the side, the, at the side medical and scientific community, how it came together, how it collaborated, and the fact that, you know, a year after this all started, we have, you know, functioning vaccines. So I think this is also a testament that when we put our minds and when we focus clearly on, on, on objectives, you know, we can do this. So I think, you know, let's also take examples, some, you know, from the scientific and, 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 and academic community globally and how they collaborated, how they broke borders, how they exchange information. So let's also see what are my some of the positive lessons as well from, uh, you know, from 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 this from this episode or episode not from this crisis. I'm sorry, this was not the right word. <laughs> Indeed, that this was confirmed by the growing importance of solidarity between member states uh, in the in the Eurobarometer survey. So we did have this this aspect there, despite Schengen being suspended and 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 many other sort of national reflexes. Of course, sorry, Alina, please. Yes. Uh, maybe just to reflect on what Ricari was saying, it's, uh, I wouldn't also say it as a failure, but maybe the expectations to those countries were higher than possibly to, uh, they could be met. And also what Heather was saying, and I totally agree with her, that EU just doesn't have it in its toolbox to be an emergency response uh, center. But aren't they, uh, but are we sure that citizens don't expect that? that's the point like if citizens expect that but eu doesn't have uh, the tools to do it and competences to do it then it will always be judged as a failure although it's just not meant to be that not meant to that to give that response but i think that in a way every crisis gives us a lesson of uh, where we mm, we don't have the um, tools, we don't have the competencies to respond on new level. It was the Euro crisis like that, it was the financial crisis. And I think that interestingly, if we were listening to the citizens' expectations over the years, with the increasing pressure of EU paying more attention to health issues and having more competencies in the health uh, care sector, maybe we would have been more prepared for, the, for this pandemic. But obviously, citizens in that case were more, um, more in line with what uh, should be done as a preparation than policymakers were able to implement or wanted to implement. So I think that lessons indeed need to be learned and uh, competencies will change and uh, our toolbox will change. But we need to be careful still not to raise the expectations to impossible levels. It's not only on EU level, but on member state level as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. I just want to reassure you there are no more questions in the chat, which means you're all crystal clear and um, our audience is digesting the many elements you bring to the table. Philip, you want to have the last word? We have one minute, please. No, I think Anthony will have the last word that I'm pretty sure about. But let me say one thing. Anthony started to read you on what will be coming next week. I can do the same and maybe then we'll meet again. Uh, last half hour, we talked about the conference in the future of Europe, and I can tell you that next week, uh, we will publish something that we have never done before, a joint inter-institutional Eurobarometer survey on the future of Europe, expectations of citizens on the same, and um, yeah, also done in last autumn and to be continued uh, very soon. And I think that will also give us quite some interesting, hopefully quite some interesting Thank insight you. into what Thank we have. You, Philip. Thank you. Sorry, I, we we have to come to cross. Uh, it's it's reassuring to hear that interinstitutional cooperation is reinforced uh, on 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 this platform as well. Anthony, do you want to have a final word, please? Well, just to say what a fabulous discussion and thank you to everybody concerned. Uh, I already shot my bolt by revealing what the next EPRS event is going to be. So why don't I say that the day after that, we also have one on Tuesday, the 16th of March, which is going to be about the new European Bauhaus, which is an attempt to humanize, if you like. Uh, so it's not just about numbers and targets, but it's about the way people live, the whole European Green Deal project. Thanks so much. It's been a fantastic discussion um, and look forward to seeing as many of us as possible on another occasion very soon. Bye bye, everybody.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. Three o'clock. Exactly. Duh.